Oh no. Welcome back to the Mentor Roulette grind. I decided to focus quite heavily on specifically playing Sage, as that gives me the strongest capability to both observe my team to give better advice, as well as better time to give said advice, and also gives me the capacity to carry quite hard when it is necessary. As you can probably already guess from the tease at the start, we did not have any extremes in this set, which is just as surprising to me. This time, we have 15 duties and carrying over from last week, that would mean a streak of 19 regular four-man duties. Despite that, there were still some interesting situations that came up in these duties today. And indeed, the first was as a 23-minute replacement in Praetorium. The most significant thing I can say about the run itself is that it seemed like everyone was doing super well. But what I really want to talk about is that the longer into Praetorium someone leaves, the weirder it is. Think about it. Some healer sat through over 20 minutes of Praetorium and then left. Also, I hope you have a great day, Bangladesh Mandalore. For duty 2, we land in Dusk Vigil as a 3 minute replacement. Given that the group still was at the first pack, it seems the healer left immediately. How strange. Now, something I noticed throughout the duty was that the tank was not great about using their defensives on AoE pulls, but to be fair, the tank didn't pull too aggressively, so this was perfectly manageable. This was a little strange though, because it seemed like the tank had a lot of other fundamentals down perfectly fine. They used defensives well on bosses, positioned very nicely on bosses, including positioning behind the rock here while still facing the boss safely away from the rest of the party. Given that they were not pulling too aggressively, I got the impression they sort of knew their own limits, and given they had so many other things going well, I felt they would learn what they need to given time. Oh, there was also this funny incident, which is weirdly common, where the boss just decides it really doesn't like this person in particular. So fun! I'm reasonably certain the way this mechanic works is at least partly related to HP percent, because the boss doesn't always chain them like this. For duty 3, I was a 48 minute replacement. You see this as a mentor, and it is pretty much bound to either be an absolute disaster, or an extreme not going well. Meaning an absolute disaster. Nevertheless, we still go in. We land in the twinning, and when you see a 48 minute replacement in the twinning, there's usually a story, right? Given the group was going at it and trying, my guesses as to what happened include Healer left mid pull, which I find unlikely given the length of the duty, although with the way the pull started with this tank, I could imagine it is possible, though unlikely. Alternatively, the healer left at some point, and no other healers queued with join party and progress enabled that could land in the twinning. I find this much more likely because of how the group was trying the pull anyway. Now. What I see is the group going at it, only for the group to suddenly wipe to, from what I could see, stepping in the defensive array beams, which causes raid-wide damage. Now, while the group runs back, I ask and check if there's any mechanics they need explained, just in case. The answer seems to be no, and we get started. So, for an excellent start, the tank accidentally steps in a defensive array beam, and then gets hit, somehow by three overlapping black and red swirls and survives. Then they get hit by another laser across the arena and after that, simply stops getting hit. I guess they learned? It was also kind of nice of them to use cover on me when I was close, but it was mildly concerning because that meant they took unnecessary damage I could have easily taken myself. I stayed close nonetheless because I think it is nice that you don't intentionally break the cover when they went out of their way to use it. Now, after an over 50 minute ordeal for this group, it is a good thing they managed to bring it home, right? For duty 4, we go to Shisui of the Violet Tides with a Red Mage first timer, which was made abundantly clear when they didn't really seem to completely understand the box on the second boss. Because I knew they were a first timer, I was expecting them to get sniped by the chase AoEs, so every time they came up, I made sure to shield them beforehand. 
This is why you say it when you're new to a duty, so that the helpful people can help you a bit extra when needed. Oh yeah, we also did the Gigapole after the first boss. I was mildly surprised that Dark Knight didn't use Living Dead when they dropped so low in HP. However, they did do something. Kiting! Yes! Good thinking! I love it! And that led us to victory, of course. For Duty 5, we got Lost City of Amdapol hard. Now, the weird part here is that the Red Mage watched the cutscenes, which might mean that they are a first-timer. But they were the only one who actually did the mechanics right on some of these bosses, where things are a bit less obvious. Just to give an example of the less obvious mechanics of this dungeon, when you see this debuff, if you go up close enough to the person with the debuff and use the slash comfort emote, it actually removes the debuff. Now, this is a relatively minor detail because it simply increases the damage the target takes by a bit for a bit, but using that emote is essentially free. Now, the first boss has a mechanic that puts down hallucinations that shoot out a Kone Wii in the direction each player was facing when the mechanic originally resolved. These hallucinations attack twice before being replaced, but the simple way to resolve this mechanic is to be looking off into a wall when it resolves. The second boss actually has a super interesting mechanic as well. It puts down orbs that do a bit of damage if you run into them, and a lot of damage in an AoE if you ignore them. Now, the thing that makes such a mechanic interesting is both that you have to choose to interact with the orbs to prevent disaster, but also because the boss gives the party debuffs that increase one of the two other elements it uses. So, if the boss puts down a wind orb, a player without the wind resistance debuff has to take it to protect those with the wind resistance debuff from taking the damage. Well, that's assuming the damage is amplified to a relevant amount, of course. The holy orbs just need to be taken at all. And again, the final boss also has an interesting mechanic where it uses Cure 4, which seems to heal the boss less for each person standing in the circle with it. Unfortunately, the fight resolves fast enough that you, of course, don't have to be perfect at all with this. For Duty 6, we land in Grand Cosmos as a 19-minute replacement. It seemed they had trouble with the furniture burning, so I guess the group certainly had some first-timers. I let them know to at least let someone who can raise have priority on furniture if we get down to the wire, and I also had to yoink the tank away from the furniture during a mechanic to be on the safe side. In fact, personally, I got the impression they had more trouble with that dashing mechanic than the mortal flames. For Duty 7, we have the Shadow Claw guild test again. Yay! Nothing out of the ordinary happened. For Duty 8, we got Keeper of the Lake. The run went Fine, but the best way I can describe it is that every pull, every pull felt kind of off. Like something weird was going on with the tank, like beyond them pulling an unusual amount of mobs a lot of the time. I couldn't quite put my finger on exactly what it was, but it just felt off. My best guess is that they had no idea what they were doing, like when they stepped out of the multi-stack mark on Midgar Solmer. Anyway, for Duty 9, we went to Sastasha Hart with a group that could, for all I know, be all first-timers. The tank pulled one pack at a time, which made the run somewhat long, but then again, we had no wipes and everything went smoothly, so that's fine. I did get the impression the damage output of the group was a bit less than usual, both because of how much the first boss got away with doing and how long the final boss went on, but this was also highlighted a bit on these ladies with the brine orbs, as usually very few or no orbs really become an issue before the mob dies. For Duty 10, we got Tower of Zot, and the only thing I could really highlight here is that I got the impression the tank really didn't want to use other defensive cooldowns than Blood Wedding, unless they felt forced to. On the one hand, this is mostly fine. On the other, it wouldn't cost them anything to use Vengeance or Rampart a bit more. For Duty 11, Brave Lux Long Stop Hard, the group was extremely efficient, so we just rushed on through. Not really anything to talk about beyond that, it went super well. For Duty 12, Kogane Castle, the tanks seemed to be a mental roulette themselves too, and things went perfectly well. Although, some of you may recall from my somewhat recent Mistakes Melees make video, the Pentaweave? Yeah, take a close look at this opener here. Thinking over what to do... Dragon Sight on the tank? Spine Shadow Dive? Geishkugul, Life Search, Lance Charge? Wait! 
Battle Litany? Oh, wait, Life Surge is running out. Wait, wait, where's the boss going? And now the boss is untargetable. Anyway, I just thought it was really funny. For Duty 13, Castrum Meridianum, the only really interesting thing to highlight is that it seemed like the Reaper was really new to their toolkit, which made perfect sense, given they were wearing the starter Reaper gear. Aside from that, duty went as expected. For Duty 14, we're back in Tower of Zod. Notice it is the same ninja from earlier. Yep, I suppose they're spamming to level, which makes good sense. This run, a few odysseys happened. The summoner was really excited to go full blast immediately on every pull, but didn't quite seem to grasp what you do when you get aggro as a result. I even dragged them over to where they were supposed to be the first time. Remember everyone, if you get aggro and you're not supposed to have it, run to the tank. It takes priority over your ruby rights or whatever it is. Run to the tank. It's your fault you have aggro now, so you have to fix it, not wait for the tank to fix it. Speaking of which, multiple pulls throughout the duty got extra scary specifically because the tank turned back to pick up mobs whenever they lost them. In fact, the giga pull here at the end of the duty got really sketchy specifically because the tank took so much damage running back and forth like this. If a DPS or healer steals aggro from the tank, it really should be the responsibility of the DPS or the healer to bring the mob to the tank. At the very least, if they do it while the tank is still rounding up mobs. Part of the reason for this is precisely because it is very hard for the tank to pick up the mobs while pulling more like this, and it is also actually quite dangerous. Part of what makes Giga Pulls possible is that the majority of the damage you should be taking from the mobs disappear because you're effectively kiting the mobs. Somehow, we didn't wipe from this. I actually wanted to say this to the tank, but they ran off before I managed to put the words together. Just to be clear, once the tank has reached its destination, there could be more reason to help pick up mobs that are running rampant, but really, it should not be this difficult. And finally for duty 15, we land in Tamtara Deepcroft hard. This duty is known to have some insanely mean mechanics. Now, normally, my rule is, let's wipe first, and then we talk about the mechanic that wiped us. However, all three bosses have essentially one and only one thing that can wipe you, so might as well give the short version, right? For the first boss, I quickly say to not hurt the zombies and let them get hit by the spread marker. What happens is that everyone ignores the zombies, but then the bard gets queasy with the spread marker, which then causes us to promptly wipe. I reiterate the problem again, and instead the bard decides to kite the zombies, again causing them to survive the spread marker. Hilariously, the best way to do this fight is to simply single target attack the boss, stack up in a blob together, and simply ignore everything else happening. If you just do nothing to the boss mechanics, you win. For the second boss, I mentioned that we need to protect the Lalafell by intercepting the orbs. Basically no one does it, which eventually leads to a sudden wipe, which came by partly as a result of me having to do everything myself, making it hard for me to actually heal the Lalafell. I reiterate that we need to do the orbs and also mention the bigger orbs might be good for the tank. I still take the majority of the orbs, but after a little bit the group starts to act. For the final boss, well, at this point you kind of have to assume they understand that ads need to be dealt with somehow in a specific way. But the fight starts with both tank and melee DPS just kinda having a tea party in the middle AoE and doesn't seem to react until I mention it's hurting them. Over the course of the fight, I also got the impression that everyone had that feeling of uh, maybe someone else will deal with it in regards to the adds, which led to me doing a lot of the ad damage. Overall, my impression of this group was that they had the idea that boss mechanics don't matter and assumed that I was an overprotective mentor that gave explanations that were unneeded, which was weird because this seemed to keep being the case even after exactly what I said would happen happened and what I said to do worked. It also seemed like the group had a strong feeling of, I don't want to do the mechanics, someone else do it. And a case of, if I just survive, maybe we can kill the boss first. Like with the bard kiting the zombies, instead of doing the mechanic like I said. In fairness, this was a group of sprouts and returning players, so maybe they haven't had this kind of difficulty with a duty before. Still weird the way they dealt with the fights though. Oh yes, finally, the tank also seemed to really like to press limit break. I was about to try and explain it at the end, but then the tank left. A really weird experience just overall this duty. 
With that, we finished this session with 77 mental roulettes done, and as I mentioned, a 19 duty streak of only 4 man regular content. Strange. A key thing that I emphasized a bit in this set is that multiple times in the session, when I saw someone that was doing something wrong, they were doing something so wrong that it would be difficult to explain in a reasonable amount of time. Or it was complicated enough of a subject that it wouldn't help very much to bring it up. For example, with the summoner gunbreaker situation in Tower of Zod. If I would explained to the summoner they needed to go to the gunbreaker with the mobs, then what would change? The gunbreaker was already chasing down the mobs the instant they started going for the summoner. Similarly, if I had told the gunbreaker to not chase down the mobs on the summoner, then given we already knew the summoner wasn't good about actually bringing the mobs to the gunbreaker, I would have to then explain separately to the summoner for things to not break apart. So instead of it being a quick tip, it would be a case of Alright everyone, stop what you're doing, I want to decide how we do this duty, which so far haven't wiped in any way, so my advice seems awfully unnecessary, don't you think? You know what I mean? Sometimes, the advice itself would be more intrusive and annoying than helpful. That is the explanation for why I didn't say much to the players in many of these duties. If things are going well, maybe just leave it. Now, that is all for this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you would like to support me and my channel more directly, you can become a member like these wonderful people here. You can also alternatively support me through Ko-Fi, link in the description. You can also support the channel by letting the YouTube algorithm know by liking the video, leaving a comment, subscribing, sharing, and hitting the bell to get notified when next I post a video. Fun fact, a boss in Lost City of Amdapal Hard uses Cure 4, which players have never had access to beyond Lost Actions. The cure for that boss uses also comes with a side dish of region it appears, and incidentally, lost cure for from Boja also applies region as a bonus side effect.